Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nick Foster, the interim director of the Wilton Historical Society, and along with my co-director of the Wilton Historical Society, Allison Sanders, I'd like to welcome you all to the third of this year's five-part history lecture series entitled Tycoons, Bane or Benefactors. On behalf of the Wilton Historical Society and the Wilton Library, I'd like to thank Moira and Kevin Craw, who are the generous sponsors for this lecture. And I'd also like to thank all of you who donated as part of your registration. Your contributions are what help make this program and others like it possible. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank the planning committee who organizes the lecture series, which is now in its 15th year. A lot of work goes into every step of creating and executing these truly, this truly excellent series. So I'd like to sincerely thank all of their efforts. Now, just one note before we actually begin, please take note of the Q&A function that should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, there will be a moderated Q&A session at the end of the lecture. So please type any questions you have um, either during the lecture or when the Q&A session starts. Um, we'll be answering questions from that Q&A function. So please enter all of your questions there um, and we'll be, be able to uh, hopefully answer your questions. So without further ado, let me turn it over to this lecture's moderator, Steve Hudsmith, who will be introducing today's speaker. So take it away, Steve. Oh, thank you very much, Nick. And a warm Wilton welcome to Julie Fenster. She's new to us as a presenter to this series that is now in its 15th year. An alumna of Colgate, Julie is a prolific author of a half dozen books. Half of those books have a biographical focus on major historical figures like Lewis Howe's relationship to FDR and to Eleanor Roosevelt. President Jefferson's commissioned expeditions like the Lewis and Clark one, and a notable murder case tried by Abraham Lincoln that helped propel him to a national stage. Other books of hers focus on scientific fields like her award-winning one on the development of the field of anesthesiology, and another more general medical one on those who brought medicine into the modern age. And even more generally still, on the spirit of invention and the thinkers, creators, and dreamers who formed our nation. That's quite a remarkable range of writing. And now she has kindly turned her attention for her benefit here today to tycoon Henry Ford and his co-tycoon at Ford Motor Company, the much lesser known James Cousins, who may represent the angel on Henry Ford's shoulder that kept Ford moving in socially beneficial ways and whose loss allowed Ford's darker side to grow unchecked. But Julie will bring that speculation on my part into sharp focus for us today. Lest you think that Julie is a stranger to things automotive, she's written two books on that subject too. The award-winning Packard, The Pride, with beautiful illustrations ranging from the 1899 Model A right up to the last model and I believe 1958, am I right? Something like <laughs> yeah. that. <laughs> and she also wrote the book, The Auto Race of a Century from New York to Paris. How they got across the Atlantic Ocean or something, you gotta read the book right now. <laughs> and in fact, Julie began her career at the Automotive Quarterly, and readily describes herself as a car fanatic. She even drives a Model T, and owns a 1930 <laughs> Model A. That's for you antique car aficionados, quite an accomplishment. So with many thanks to tonight's sponsors and without further ado, I give you Julie Fenster. Well, thank you very much. I, I was hoping for a trip to Wilton, um, but uh, uh, COVID spoiled that hope for me, but I, a lot of my topics do have to do with Connecticut. So I'm kind of, a, kind of feeling comfortable being uh, uh, beamed into Connecticut uh, today. I, I do love cars. I am absolutely astonished that a little metal and some gasoline can make you go as fast as you want. It's just, I'll never get over that. Uh, it's thrilling to me. But today we're really talking more about um, one of the men behind the car company, uh, Ford Motor, obviously, Henry, Henry Ford. Um, I've written quite a few articles about him um, on different topics. One of them was uh, how he preferred, um, this is kind of interesting in a business sense, uh, vertical integration of his company to what General Motors was horizontal in integration um, in the 20s and 30s, 40s. That fascinated me because Henry Ford owned 
his company, for the most part, lock, stock, and barrel. So he could say, why should we buy wood from somebody? We can buy our own forests. Why should we buy, why should we pay a railroad? We'll start our own railroad. So he tried to just keep pushing, pushing, pushing to where he owned every, every aspect of his company. And that, that fascinated me. It's quite out of the, uh, I think General Motors is considered the more modern company now. But in any case, that's that was the beginning of my interest in Henry uh, Henry Ford and the Ford Motor Company. Um, and when I started that article, uh, I used to run around asking all my friends, "What do you know?" Whenever you write history, it's always a problem to figure out what what do people already know about this topic. Um, you know, am I telling them things they already know? So. The, the conclusion I came to was that what everybody knew about Henry Ford was that he would sell you a car in any color as long as it was black. And um, I look around today and I say, well, let's, he was ahead of his time because now they sell you any color as long as it's charcoal gray, I think. Um, but I, that was one thing that wasn't, um, that was sort of true. He didn't actually say it. So there's, there's one that's true. Another thing people said was that he invented the car, which uh, I'm sure you're all sophisticated enough to know that he did not invent the car. Uh, that was in um, sort of a trade-off between uh, France and Germany. Or though, although there were cars in like 1810, another interesting aspect of invention is that there were self-propelled um, vehicles in, in the early 19th century. It's just that that was before anybody was that interested. Uh, they still preferred horses or walking. Um, so they didn't catch on then. And that kind of enters into our story. Uh, another thing people said about Henry Ford was that he invented the assembly line. Um, I know since I'm talking to historical experts from Connecticut that you know that isn't true. Um, oh, Connecticut being kind of the Detroit of uh, the 19th century, if you will, the manufacturing and invention center of the country, uh, there were assembly lines at, at uh, a lot of the, first of all, the gun manufacturers, as you know. I can go even further back in history, the, the um, 16th century Venetians had assembly lines for their boats and uh, kind of astonishing how they could turn out a fully loaded uh, boat in a matter of hours. I think a lot of hours, 24 or something, but still amazing that assembly lines have been around. What Henry Ford did, let's go to what he uh, did do on that kind of score is that he, he did bring mass production on a sophisticated, difficult product one of the most difficult at that time, the automobile. He brought mass production, his company certainly brought that about. He called mass production the new messiah. That was his name for mass production. And, um, and, and you know, he believed that it was going to change society uh, mostly because of the automotive part. So when we talk about whether Henry Ford was a bane or a benefactor, um, I, I think you can kind of figure he's two, two different people. He's kind of the, the automotive part. He was a benefactor in his mind. And the rest of it, I, I think, is much more checkered, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, kind of leads into the fact that in his day, in his time, I'm telling you, Henry Ford was considered an absolute idol of the people. He was um, it just heralded as the, the populist man of the people, the, the only millionaire who really was still the same old guy he ever was, um, idolized in his time. Um, so they would say back in 19, you know, name and year, 1910 to 19, you know, 20, they would have said, he is absolutely the benefactor. He's the only guy that understands us. He's the one that's gonna save American capitalism. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. It's that one's neither, neither, um, neither as untrue as the fact that he invented the car or as, as true as the fact that he, uh, that Model Ts were black after a certain point. So you got the truisms, the falsehoods and somewhere in between is what we'll talk about today. Henry Ford, um, is often known, part of his legend, 
as a farm boy, a poor farm boy who became very wealthy. Well, I have to dispel that. They weren't poor. The, the Fords had a farm in Dearborn, Michigan, but they weren't poor. They were, you know, kind of upper middle class for that area. Um, the two things I want to bring up that you don't know, I'll bet you, about Henry Ford in, in his farm days. First of all, one, of the, one thing I like is that um, everybody on the farm had to, there he is, everybody on the farm had to wake up early, and, you know, do their chores. And in Henry Ford's family, his father said, uh, Henry didn't like to wake up early. He said, my brain doesn't wake up until around 10 o'clock. And Henry Ford's father said, okay, that's good, that's fine, let him sleep late. So for all of us whose brains don't wake up until 10 o'clock, I would like to say that uh, it's probably good not to push that issue uh, as Henry Ford's father didn't push it with Henry. The other thing, as we know, um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit because I think you all know that Henry Ford had a horrible reputation, well earned later in his life for his, um, his uh, anti-Semitism, his um, the pro-fascist, really terrible political views that he um, espoused. Well, his family was, he didn't get it from his family. I've heard, I've read and heard that, well, he came from rural, rural Michigan. What do you expect? You know, like rural Michigan is some, you know, hotbed of such horrible thoughts. Well, his family, his father subscribed to the New York Times throughout Henry Ford's entire life. His father subscribed to a lot of the New York, um, you know, more progressive publications that he, his family said over and over again, there were no thoughts like that in, in their household. So the farm he sprang from, I don't wanna say was some, some you know, answer to the whole, uh, whole issue of Henry Ford's, um, uh, you know, adulthood. He, he was well brought up, but he had a lot of choices and came from a, a good, um, I would say liberal minded home in the in the small L sense they they were they were um, they were not Hicks. Uh, so Henry Ford was absolutely fascinated with mechanical things, anything mechanical. He took apart watches, you know, uh, before I even, you know, at an age when I couldn't even tell time, he was already taking apart watches and putting them back together um, as a very as a little boy. Uh, so he went to Detroit, the nearby city of Detroit, and went through the process then, which was not to go to school to learn mechanical arts, but to, you know, serve an apprenticeship and become a journeyman and then um, strike out on your, on your own as a career, what they called a mechanic then, not meaning a mechanic on automobile things, but a mechanic on anything. Um, and of course, as he and I say, of course, because a person of his ilk, someone who um, who loved mechanical things, well, when he read about cars, you know, in Europe and then seeping over to America, but more so when he saw the first car that came to Detroit, it was love at first sight, to, to use the cliche, but he really thought, you know, that, now that is worth dedicating your life to. And he, he immediately, you know, looked at every car, talked to car people, built one, you know, tried to build one, did kind of build one. I mean, it, it, it ran um, and uh, um, got involved in racing. I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but between the racing he, and the talking and getting involved with cars, he really got an excellent reputation as someone who knew their stuff. He knew he, he in Detroit, he was known as one of the more advanced thinkers on automotive um, technology, such as it was back then. And such as it was back then was that people built a car one at a time, um, uh, one mechanic, now we are on mechanics, but one mechanic would walk around the factory, pick up the parts and put them on a car. And when he was done, you know, sort of shout out, well, I got one, you know. Um, so there was a plenty to do in making this a more efficient process. Uh, so Henry Ford started one or, uh, a, a car company, sort of one and a half car companies, and they didn't do well, but no matter, because in those days, it was sort of the computer era of 
what we knew in the you know 1980s or 90s or something where yeah they car companies came and went but that didn't ruin your reputation uh, if you if you were on one that had had it went and and so um, a new group a new group of investors I, I I use that you know in quotes almost uh, capitalized Ford Ford Motor Company in 1903 supposedly with $100,000, but with the, you know, the Hollywood bookkeeping of the day, the, they actually only gathered up together, only scratched together about $10,000, but they split up the shares. And, and, uh, and one of the people that uh, put this together was a coal merchant and the coal merchant's um, assistant was named James Cousins. James Cousins was a, uh, a Canadian by birth, but a Detroit resident. And here he is up on your screen. Uh, Henry Ford, of course, is on the right, kind of a bean pole. And James Cousins is on the left. And Cousins, uh, you know, took this, took this company, you know, he had, they gave him two and a half percent of the stock as a kind of a, just a gift, if he would be one of the original workers at the company, sort of running the office, they called him the secretary treasurer. And uh, uh, he sank his teeth into the Ford Motor Company and knew that this was everything he ever wanted, a new business. Uh, his background was a couple years at a business school and then uh, simply wanting to find a business. Did James Cousins love cars the way Henry Ford and I do? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think he wanted to get involved with a business where he could grow and grow and apply his phenomenal energies and, and um, organizational ability. So, um, so James Cousin, Cousins kind of went from being someone who, yeah, he had a job and a couple shares of stock or a, couple, a percentage of stock, but it could have gone in any, in any direction. He's the one that turned himself into a kind of a, a definite human locomotive at, at Ford Motor. He, he was the one that got things done and uh, other personalities dropped away and it kind of devolved down to these two men you see before you. Um, in, in most ways, Henry Ford was known that he was never at his desk. He was always wandering around the factory floor trying to improve the three or four models that the Ford Motor was making back then. He wasn't, he didn't like to be in his office. He liked to be on the floor of the factory or in the design rooms. James Cousins was just the opposite. He was, you know, working the phones, working the telegrams, working everything to build up a sales force to, you know, find ways to ship all of these cars all over the country. So I guess what I'm saying to anybody who's ever had a great idea for an entrepreneurial venture, you can't get a better person on your staff or a better partner than James Cousins because he's the one that that uh, did all of the all of the things that let the creative side, the Henry Ford side, really stretch and go. Um, I can sort of see without someone like James Cousins or James Cousins pushing the pedals, I can see where this Ford Motor Company would also have failed because uh, there were a lot of automotive geniuses. I'm not saying they were equal to Henry Ford, but there were a lot of terrific ideas, but there weren't that many companies that lasted more than a two or three years in those days. And uh, so if you ever start a company, look for, look for the bulldog like, Bill, like Cousins was. Um, and so that brings us sort of to where Henry Ford thought, you know, our cars are mostly popular because they're sturdy. People like sturdy cars, you know, they don't want to fix them necessarily. And he gave that, he really did have an epiphany by all accounts saying, I want to build a car that isn't very expensive, but is high quality, not luxurious, but made of the best metals, the best designs put together in the best way so that it's, it's not going to break. And also, you know, everybody today has off-road vehicles or at least all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive or any old drive. Um, one of the terrific aspect, aspects of Henry Ford's car was due to the suspension and um, to some extent the transmission. It could go anywhere. It was delightful in that way. It could really be a, 
uh, you know, an off-road vehicle. And that was a pretty good selling point at a time when there were not many roads. So an awful lot of people needed a quote unquote off-road vehicle. They didn't have driveways. They didn't have, um, they didn't really didn't have paved roads. Uh, a lot of places just depended on railroads. You, you somehow got yourself into town, took a railroad wherever you were going, or took a train wherever you were going. Um, so the, 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 that shows the little divide in these two men in terms of their job responsibilities. But now I wanna bring out the fact that Henry Ford's reputation as, as and again, we're kinda, I'm talking about the fact that he was the idol of millions, um, truly, that the working man considered him, you know, a best friend because he was one of us. He wasn't just another tycoon. He was one of us. So how did all how did that reputation, folksy Henry Ford, uh, as a benefactor, you know, extraordinaire? How did that come about? And I credit um, uh, James Cousins, which is very interesting beyond the automobile, you know, history because the subject of who gets credit for things is absolutely fascinating and mysterious in everything we do, you know, I, I'll never understand why the people who do the least often get the most credit. And that's, that's something I'm pretty sure you've seen as much as I have, and it's not being bitter or, you know, telling tales, I'm more just saying it's really fascinating how the, how the tides go, to, go in a certain direction. And maybe in this case, we can see how, because in three respects that I can mention, James Cousins built the reputation of Henry Ford, while Henry Ford was on the factory floor, uh, unquestionably bringing about the mass production, we just said he uh, considered the new messiah. Um, James Cousins, it, uh, here's the first thing. In those days, there was something called, if there are any lawyers out there, called the Selden patent. And uh, very briefly, because you could talk for 17 hours and still not understand the Selden patent suits. But there's a picture of all the various cars in around 1909. The Selden patent was, was uh, got fellow not far from where I am right now in Rochester, New York, maintained that he had a patent on the automobile. And for a couple years there, every car you see before you now would have to pay a certain amount of money, a fair amount of money for those days, $50 or so, to get a certificate that said that it had complied with the Selden patent. And you can understand this was worth a fortune. Um, the Ford Motor Company, fledgling as it was, just getting into the, um, <clears throat> the Model T Ford. Let me just take a drink here because I'm, I'm blabbing too much. But um, the, the Ford Motor Company was going to pay the patent you know, rights for each of their cars and get the little certificate that everybody put on their dashboard. And it was, um, <clears throat> it was James Cousins who, though not a lawyer by trade, studied the law backward and forward. And he was the one who said Ford Motor is not going to comply. <clears throat> He's, he, um, he came up with the idea of promising every customer, if you are ever stopped or incur any kind of penalty for not, not uh, having your certificate that says you paid money for the Selden patent, uh, we will pay it. We will more than pay it. And uh, we guarantee that. And through means like that and plain stubbornness, uh, James Cousins was behind the fact that Ford Motor broke the Selden patent. Uh, and you, that was considered a David and Goliath kind of move that, again, Henry Ford was credited with being the, the slayer of the, the dragon on that. <clears throat> um, the, the, second, the second thing that Cousins did, again, I'll start with what Henry Ford was credited. Henry Ford was credited. Here's the, here are the, here are the first 
uh, investors, I mean, I'm sorry, workers, uh, office workers at the Henry, at the Ford Motor and, and our hero, James Cousins is on the right. Um, the other two are the kind of investors and early workers that I mentioned, you know, could have stayed with the company and made a fortune, but they drifted off uh, as people do. And James Cousins dug in his fingernails and said, this is my future. Uh, but Henry Ford um, <coughs> is, is often credited, I mean, he is credited with the fact that anybody anywhere could get a Ford. Uh, I, I'm going to amaze you, or at least amaze myself, by saying that um, as of 1911, I think it is, any city, every city in America, bigger than 1,000 population, had a Ford agency. So you say, well, you know, it's not a dealership like our mega dealerships today, but they had a person who had a connection, who had credit enough to order cars from Ford Motor. That's astonishing. Uh, and how did they do it? Well, James Cousins came up with this idea that they went to a, he would, he or his staff would go to a bank in every town of more than a thousand people and say, here's what we'll do. Ford Motor will deposit a considerable sum of money, of cash in your bank. We're not guaranteeing any kind of loan or credit, but you'll have our money in your bank and the prestige of having our money in your bank. And all you have to do for that is to find someone and give them credit, <clears throat> give them credit to start a Ford agency. Well, it worked, it worked. Banks wanted that cash. And for that cash, they would find some responsible person, businessman in town, often someone who had some other business as well. And, uh, and so Fords were everywhere. It was the most egalitarian automobile of its time. You know, there, there, it wasn't a, uh, often cars are called in those days, a rich man's toy. I don't know that all of them were a rich man's toy. There were inexpensive cars even in the <clears throat> first years of the century, but it was much more of an urban. That's the thing it was, it was an urban toy. <laughs> it was an urban vehicle. Partly because, as I said, there were no roads, but also because there were no dealers, you know, and now you had dealers everywhere, you had customers everywhere, and <clears throat> you talk about putting America on wheels, America, every place, you know, spotted horse Wyoming, you could still get a car, and Henry Ford was just beloved, beloved by, <clears throat> by Americans for that, so I'm giving credit to James Cousins for that. Uh, incredible innovation. Um, and the third thing, which was uh, so explosive in its day, is that um, if you go to the next slide, the, Henry, the Ford Motor Company, I'm not going into the statistics. Oh, there's James, there's James Cousins. Uh, I laugh because he was known as being extremely irascible. They called him the, Henry Ford called him the bear behind his back. He was <clears throat> all business all the time. And um, if he said, I wanna come see you, that's what you would see when you opened his office door and you didn't want to because he really expected 100% perfect work all the time. Um, <clears throat> but, he, um, but the Ford Motor Company was succeeding. You know all of that. I could astonish you with you know, how, many, how many cars they were turning out. It was amazing. Henry Ford did a great job people like Charles Sorensen and <clears throat> some other people have come down in history for just uh, proving how efficient American manufacture could be. But <clears throat> for all of those cars they were building and for all of the advances in mass production, it was machinery, it was the introduction of machinery. So car in the space of 12 years, maybe less, thanks to Henry Ford, thanks to the Ford Motor Company, uh, an automobile worker went from being a person with a kind of a fascinating or at least very intriguing job. You'd start with a chassis and you'd go get each part and you'd put it on and it was quite interesting. And then you, when you were done, you were done. And man, they're, they're, that's the kind of production they had. <clears throat> and uh, that's the Ford Motor Company, Ford factory at Highland Park. <clears throat> but now you introduce 
machine after machine, they say every single day a major, some kind of machine was introduced. Machines were introduced such that there was barely room, barely room for people, for the, the workers. And uh, the work got to be very monotonous. And um, <clears throat> I'm just looking at my notes here. I just read this one, so I will astonish you maybe that they had to, in order to, <clears throat> in order to hire a hundred workers, in order to add a hundred workers, Ford Motor had to hire 963 because nobody stayed. They had 50% uh, or so um, <clears throat> people quit every single month. And <clears throat> that was, were, you know, worse at more Ford Motor than at most other car companies because Ford Motor was more automated and automated equaled monotonous, unfortunately, for the employees. And uh, so <clears throat> here we come in with what I, what was an absolute economic bombshell in 1914. Um, <clears throat> and it really did derive from James Cousins. The average pay then, okay, daily rate was around $2.40. I know that doesn't sound like much today, but it was sort of low, but barely livable, but <clears throat> that's what everybody paid in Detroit. And um, I'm just going to read a little because it's because I really get a kick out of um, James Cousins. I'm trying to express how he just was the little fish that swam in the other direction. He was reading a socialist magazine called Everybody's. Socialist wasn't, you know, at the outer edge of socialism, but sort of socialist magazine, Everybody's. And uh, I'll just read here. He saw a letter from a reader who asked, why, if your magazine believes in socialism, <clears throat> do you not practice what you preach in your own affairs? So this account says, the editor answered that progress had to be universal, that until everyone changed, a single company could not change and survive. And here's the quote from James Cousins when he was telling Ida Tarbell, the great journalist, this story, he said, that was an asinine answer. He just thought that was cowardice, obviously, to say, oh, well, until everybody changes, I can't change. So in a flash, this happened in late December <clears throat> of, two th of 23, I'm sorry, what year are we in? Of 1913, he reads everybody's, he, he doesn't like, the fact that they're saying until the whole world changes and treats their workers better, they're not going to treat their workers better. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he came up with the idea, James Cousins did, of the $5 day, just about twice what everybody else was uh, paying. And first he had to get it by um, Henry Ford. So again, I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to read that, uh, that uh, Henry Ford raised objections. He said, we pay the same as everybody else. And Cousins said, but we're responsible for these men <clears throat> because we don't pay them enough to live on. We should give our people wages that permit them to save against the time when we have no work for them. Well, this little discussion went on and Henry Ford went back and talked to one of the accountants who tended to agree with him. And he came back <clears throat> uh, and and said he'll think about it. So it says Cousins pressed for a decision because the one thing Cousins knew about Ford and almost everybody else was if, if, we, uh, if we don't talk of it for more than 48 hours, we'll never do it. I think I'm gonna write that on above my desk. If you don't, if you think of it and don't do it <clears throat> for more than 48 hours, you're never gonna do it. So Ford came back and said, all right, I agree, $3.50 a day. Cousin said, no, it's five or nothing. Then make it four, Ford said. No, Cousin said, five or nothing. And then Cousins added, <clears throat> a straight $5 wage will be the greatest advertisement any automobile concern ever had. And Henry Ford, who told this story, said, Cousins didn't have to say that twice because there's nothing like advertising when it came to Fords in those days. So here's a, a headline from the New York Times, page one. Absolute, as I say, <clears throat> knocked people over that Ford Motor was going to double wages. <clears throat> um, 
they immediately were inundated. Go to the next slide. I, I have two or three there uh, of these newspaper. Yeah, 10,000 people is the Washington Times, page one. 10,000 people rushed to get the get this $5 um, a day. I'll say parenthetically, it's kind of another topic, but this, this had a lot to do with um, the great migration because um, <clears throat> African-Americans in the South didn't make nearly that much. And so the $5 day becoming national news was even important uh, on that social aspect, but certainly economically, um, the headline, the, the an editorial that I wrote down said, "This is just just one one person's opinion, but in the history of the world, nothing in the way of profit sharing has equaled the mammoth Ford idea. Every previous attempt looks puny in comparison. Um, the idea of paying these fellows." They were all men, I'm kind of getting off the topic. At, at first, James Cousins said, of course it's for the, our male and female workers, but Henry Ford said, no, I don't pay female workers the same as men. So <clears throat> in that respect, he's a bane, not a benefactor, but uh, Cousins prevailed on that and it changed later. That's a little footnote. But uh, um, the $5 day was an enormous success. It gave the Ford Motor Company pick of the litter for, for all of the workers. It gave them, uh, uh, the, the attrition rate went down to, you know, something like it, it had been 50% a month, it went to 3% a month. Um, productivity went way up. They didn't, they saved so much money. I think I have a quote here somewhere, but Henry Ford called it the greatest cost cutting measure ever. And economists at the time, <clears throat> Other, other tycoons, other company owners who were you know, just spitting bullets that Henry Ford had done anything like give his workers a living wage. They were furious. So when he maintained that it was actually a cost cutting measure to pay your workers right so that you didn't have so many labor problems, um, <clears throat> it became at least a little bit more uh, of, a, of an economic reality that, that you know, you, you'd share your profits with your workers. You'd, you weren't, I think Henry Ford said, you didn't want a company that was all <clears throat> uh, slave drivers and, and millionaires. He didn't, you know, he, he got it to that extent. And, uh, and so the, the $5 day isn't spoken of a lot today, but yet I think it, it had sweeping ramifications you know, even up to our day as far as expectations on labor and the fact that, yeah, you can get, you know, what everybody's paying, quote unquote, is no longer a, an excuse <clears throat> or, you know, not an accepted one because there are other levels to your business than just pay the people less. You know, you can get, <clears throat> you can, as cousins did, you can see where it is, um, it is so much better for the bottom line to actually pay your workers better. That was revolutionary at the time. Again, Ford got credit for the $5 day, uh, but at least our crowd today knows where it really came from. Um, <clears throat> and so as I wrap this up, put on another picture of a Model T Ford, because that's, yeah, how can you not? I like to look at cars. Um, after, uh, so, because uh, James Cousins had a, you know, a, a big fight with um, Henry Ford. Uh, it was actually, it was actually kind of political in nature, um, and uh, and he quit and took his thirty million dollars and went into politics and philanthropy. He he gave a fortune to all kinds of children's charities and children's hospitals, and that's. That's what he worked on. And then he was a senator for about the last dozen years of his life. He died in, <clears throat> I think it was 1936. Henry Ford, meanwhile, um, you know, we don't have time to go into it today per se, but sort of the, the real Henry Ford came out. Uh, so many people said there were two Henry Fords. One was positive and one was very dark. And in the 20s, the, the very dark Henry Ford came out. Um, <clears throat> 
with the he bought the local newspaper Dearborn Independent and turned it into a, a national uh, periodical for fascist views and just virulent, ugly, stupid anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, it, it really did find an audience. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm one of the many people who can never understand why, why, why did he have to do that? Except that he had this other side. Um, also his relationship with labor, if you go to the next <clears throat> slide, the Ford Motor Company dropped the $5 day, at, at, you know, or the idea of profit sharing. <clears throat> and this is a picture, um, I think it's 1941, but there was labor strife, horrible labor strife throughout the 1930s <clears throat> um, at the Ford Motor Company in particular. They were, they were pretty openly violent. Uh, and so again, sort of the real Henry Ford came out, Bain, not an effector. Um, <clears throat> so sort of overall, as we conclude, and there's one more picture of a car there. <laughs> as we conclude our, our, our kind of, you know, using these two men as an example of, um, uh, you get credit for something as Henry Ford did and the best I can say about a lot of the more positive things for which he was idolized is that he allowed them to go through as the, the major shareholder of Ford Motor. You know, he, he, he didn't say no to some of James Cousins' ideas. <clears throat> um, but in terms of tracing who, who, get, who gets the credit for these kind of, um, you know, uh, really seismic almost philosophical changes that uh, emerged from Ford Motor, um, it's, a, it's a much more complicated story than and having any, you know, having one man, uh, especially uh, Henry Ford, who I think was deeply, deeply uh, checkered. You know, just he really was two, two people and, um, and when you have someone like that, maybe even in a marriage sometimes, I don't know, but in any case, uh, James Cousins was the one who could, who could uh, foster the, the, the benefactor of an enormously successful company like Ford Motor. So <clears throat> um, you can, uh, if you in your minds could just change that to Cousins on the grill, then my, talk will have been a success. But I do thank you for your attention. Are there any questions or Steve? Steve, are, are you uh, able to answer, ask any I'm questions? I'm coming right back on. Uh, and <laughs> Julie, thank you for a fascinating presentation. It was really well done. And my word, it's quite a story of Ford and Cousins and what the consequence was. And also what happened to Cousins' career from then on as a politician is quite impressive. Yeah. Um, let me begin by asking a couple of questions that have already come up and I think are really interesting. Did increasing the daily wage to $5 increase the volume of Ford cars purchased by Ford employees? Yeah, that was <clears throat> absolutely great point. That was one of the one of the um, the ripple effects of this of this uh philosophy of paying your workers a lot, guess what the first thing they bought was? And definitely it, it, was, a, it was a big part of popularizing Ford cars. And a related question that uh, followed that was when did Ford Motor Company Institute an employee car purchase incentive program? Well, I don't think they had one. Yeah, I think that was a post-war invention. I don't think, uh, I don't think employees got a break. I, I guess I shouldn't answer that, but I don't think they got a break on the price because the price was very low. But I'll look into that. <clears throat> you mentioned African-American migration uh, from the South up to the North. Was the Ford Motor Company hiring African-Americans at the point in the early about 1914, 15, 16 period? Yes, they were. Yes, the, the, um, the Detroit was always, uh, in need of employees. And so both the, the Eastern Europeans 
flooding into New York City and the uh, their migration, you know, to Detroit, there was always a job for them someplace, maybe seasonal, but, <clears throat> and um, Ford Motor um, also hired African-Americans. Did Ford get pushed back on that? Ford, the company get pushed back on that? Or was that just understood to be necessary to get the four cars produced? Yeah, I think, I, I don't, I don't know of any car company then that wouldn't hire Africans, African Americans for, you know, to work at the factory, <clears throat> to work at the and on the factory floor. I, you know, the the there's no question that there were areas where Eastern Europeans, to some extent, and unfortunately and tragically, African Americans were not allowed in certain aspects of the company, but on the assembly line they were. And did that change at all as Ford became both anti-Semitic and uh, fascist in his orientation by the 30s, I guess? Yeah, no, uh, um, there was, um, no, the, that was, came back to haunt um, the production companies during World War II. There were, <clears throat> there was, um, there were, cons there were riots at Ford Motor and also even more so at General Motors <clears throat> because African-Americans had worse working conditions and <clears throat> almost no chance for advancement. So World War II, I think of as sort of when it, when it uh, reached a, a boiling point. It was one early question, it's a fascinating one too, and I'll read it to you. On March 14th, um, 1916, McPherson versus Buick was decided by the New York Court of Appeals and Judge Cardoza wrote the court's opinion. Cardoza opined that a car is an inherently dangerous instrument. To what extent do you see American legal jurisprudence impacting public perception of automobiles? Now, I know, I know McPherson v. Buick as the start of the, uh, the proposition that you no longer need to have privity, because I think in that case, the sale was by a dealer to a customer not by Buick, the parent manufacturer, but Cardoza found, nevertheless, Buick should be liable. Yeah, I don't. I good deal at the time. Yeah, I think you you're speaking to that very well. Um, I think the whole idea of liability um, and uh, and the fact you know car insurance went back further than than you'd ever think because you know immediately more much more dangerous even than horse and carriage. So. Um, I can't speak to it except in a general way to say that uh, the law and the automobile had to come together really quickly. And uh, so that's why I think you see a lot of the big cases in the first dozen years of the century. Well, and here's another great question. What reasons do you see why Henry Ford's dark side, particularly the fascist portion of it, surfaced? as it did? Well, I th um, I'll tell you why, because <clears throat> after James Cousins left, Henry Ford wanted 100% uh, of the stock, effectively 100% of the stock. And so he told the other stockholders, you know, a smattering of other stockholders, uh, I want to buy you out. And they said, no, we, we like our, you know, 10,000% dividends on what we <laughs> invested. <laughs> And so what he did was he said, uh, I'm no longer going to make the car um, under the Ford Motor Company name. I'm going to make the car under another name. I mean, he was playing, you know, hardball. And so they said, well, if you're going to start another company, uh, you know, parallel company and render our dividends down to zero, we'll sell, we'll sell, we'll sell. So he owned 100% of the company by, certainly by 1919. And in my view, uh, uh, that's when there was nobody to say him nay. There was nobody he particularly respected. Um, I mean, he, he just had knocked off or driven away anybody that might be his equal. And, um, and I, I'm sure that uh, I could name five of the people in addition to Cousins who would have read him the riot act for publicizing or even having those fascist, anti-Semitic, racist views, but publicizing them. Uh, there was nobody to say, you know, um, you're ruining the company, you know, you're hurting the company, which 
you know, it kept going apace, but it didn't help. And uh, so when you don't have anybody, uh, uh, you know, my mind is going to uh, current events and Putin, when you have absolutely nobody to say you nay. And that's when things went dark for Henry Ford. Well, let me ask you on that score, was Ford married, Julie? Did he have any spouse to be a sounding board? Yes, he had. He was a <clears throat> married to uh, Clara, was his wife's name, and they had one son, Edsel. Um, and he, uh, you know, he had a fairly normal relationship with Clara, but he he wasn't um, he wasn't a man with much respect for women. So as much as he liked her, and he called her the Great Believer, was his nickname because she always encouraged him to strike out and try something new. But uh, there's no real feeling that, that, I mean, she disapproved heartily of all of this. I should give her credit and Edsel, they both just were in agony over what he had, what he was saying that was antithetical to Clara and certainly Edsel. In any case, they, um, they couldn't stop him. I don't think, I don't think he would listen to any woman where anything uh, <clears throat> important was concerned. There's another fascinating question um, at Smith House. Would you say Tim Cook was the James Cousins to Steve Jobs, Henry Ford? <laughs> well, he's a, wasn't he a little younger or another generation sort of? Uh, uh, Cook came kind of after Jobs, right? Where, where Cousins was present at the creation. So um, wasn't it Wozniak? Was that the fellow's name that, that worked with Steve Jobs? At the, yes, I in the garage. So. <laughs> yeah, I guess we have to we have to limit our our cousins, uh, you know, honor to the people <laughs> who were there when it was scary, scary new. <laughs> wow, Cook, that's a Cook nice. Inherited a, a nice Cook inherited that's, a terrific thing. But here's a great question from Steve Rutterman, who, uh, with his wife Joyce, sends oh. greetings to you oh. especially. <laughs> Yeah. Your old friends, right? My old friends. <laughs> Best very, people very cool. in the world. <laughs> Ask an easy <laughs> question, Steve. <laughs> well, Steve asked you, I think, a fairly tough question. I, I think it's based on uh, Milton Hershey's approach to things. Uh, and what he's asking, did Ford Motor Company provide subsidized employee uh, housing communities at no. some point? <clears throat> uh, during the war, to some extent, that they had to uh, during World War II. But no, that wasn't that, they, that company town mentality kind of thing didn't take hold in Detroit. That's one of the reasons Cousins was pretty adamant that people be paid a little more. And let me ask you, and as I recall, the Ford Motor Company moved very quickly at the start of World War II to move into tank and other major armament production, right? Yeah, it was a yeah. major transition and they pulled it off quite well, notwithstanding right. whatever may have been Ford's fascist views. How yeah, did all exactly. that happen? Yeah, exactly. The, the, the joke then was that um, for Henry Ford was, you know, quite elderly by then. And um, the, the word around Detroit was that they only they paid their bills by weighing the bills on a male scale and estimating how much the bills were for. I mean, that was kind of an apocryphal way of saying it was a screwed up company with, you know, dubious management. And yet, as you say, the screwed up company uh, did the job in World War II with all of the labor problems, social problems, getting employees at all, um, at finding enough mail scales for all those bills. Now, whatever it was, they, they did a good job in uh, World War II um, but uh, the, um, you know, the company, uh, I guess the government it was at the highest level. I was going to ask, did the army basically take over the production line? And no, what the, no, what they did was, I think it was even President Roosevelt was involved with this, but they, they called the Navy and they said, you have a, a young officer in training there, Henry Ford II, bring him back because Henry Ford couldn't, you know, I mean, Edsel Ford was running the company pretty well, but at some point they had to, as a matter of national security, bring Henry Ford II back. Uh, nobody could take a, any kind of command, as you say, because the Ford family at that point owned 100% of the stock. 
so there was no it's sense of uh, how, the, how they got those out. I mean, the Cardoza we heard about before did the famous decision in Meinhard v. Salmon some years later that oh, said yeah. you can't screw your partners that way, right? You yeah, can't yeah, do that I, to your fellow owners. But I, that, yeah, <laughs> and it's not how for all of the you know people we have in this country who have a fortune, nobody nobody works that way. Uh, <sighs> economy is so much more complicated so wow. he's he uh hung on they finally issued stock i guess in the very late 40s hmm. um then there's some a couple more really excellent questions uh here's this one that harks back to something we we're talking about a little while ago i thought i remembered something about one of the big reasons for the wage increase was to help workers buy ford cars and that's something you already addressed julie then the yeah. second yeah. part of the question is is that the case? Yes. And if so, to what extent did that play into the Ford Cousins discussions about the initiative that their own workers would buy the cars, be able to buy the cars? And would yeah, buy that cars? that actually wasn't um, in all of the memoirs and things that wasn't brought up. I think that was a fringe benefit, um, just helping the whole economy. I've even seen studies where the $5 day, whether the employees bought the cars or not, the number of uh, Model Ts that were purchased in the near Ford factories went way up because all those workers were spending more money at their groceries and spent, suddenly there was just more money. And whether it was the Ford workers or somebody else, people used that first couple hundred they ever got to buy one of the cars. So it was a ripple effect that came back, rippled oh, back to Ford Motor. <laughs> Ford was a multiplier for the whole economy. That's pretty impressive. And not just in Dearborn, but well beyond, I gather. Right, right. That's that's exactly right. Well, the next question actually goes to that international element of the beyond and says, hearkening back to his ancestry, uh, Ford was the biggest private employer in Ireland during the 20th century. Is Ford still a player in Ireland's current economy? Uh, it is. Um, and one of the reasons it was a, a big player in, in Ireland was that uh, Ford was involved with tractors. And one of the big companies in Ireland, big manufacturing company, maybe the biggest in the 20s was Ferguson Tractors. And Ford bought that out. Uh, and, and, and that's how they, they started growing not only their own tractor business, Fordson, over, and over here, but became a big player in Ireland. Well, those Ford tractors are still very popular today. I think they captured the blue color the same way uh, that uh, the, the green one was captured by uh, yeah, the deer. folks. At, yeah, John, John Deere. Deere's. Right, exactly. everybody's got their color. Um, it's really quite amazing to me um, how Ford and Cousins were able to relate in that way, one on the production line doing the technical stuff, which I gather you're saying was one of Ford's really great accomplishments. He understood the engineering of automobiles in a very effective way. He did. He was, he was very advanced. Um, for example, in metallurgy, he, he was a big proponent of a new kind of um, metal, van vanadium steel which is widely used now, but he pioneered that in the United States. And in Europe, it was only used in high, high falutin luxury cars. But he said, I want vanadium for, for our, you know, low, low cost Model T. So he was so ahead of his time. But then I have to tell you a quick story that some of the people that helped him uh, design the Model T took it upon themselves to improve it a little bit when Ford was on a trip to Europe with his wife. And when they got back, they rolled this car out. It was a little longer, a little different, but not too different, but improved. And Ford took one look at it and said, how dare you? And he went, being Henry Ford, got a sledgehammer and smashed it to bits without even looking at it. Uh, you know, so, so advanced and so what's the opposite of advanced, you know? Well, he's a bit of an ego, <laughs> dude, right? I mean, uh... Maybe we might call him today a sociopath. That if it wasn't his, yes. he didn't want to be part of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was his baby. Yeah, yeah, it was it was him in metal and metal and uh, you know leather. There was no question he and the Model T. Um, well, and you mentioned those Model Ts were well known for being what we would consider today an off-road vehicle. 
yes. uh, in part because of transmissions and suspensions. Was Ford making those transmissions and suspensions too, or were they was he buying them elsewhere? Yeah, yeah. Well, in the early days of the automobile, almost everybody made things off by buying things off the shelf, and even Ford was buying his motors from Dodge, the Dodge brothers, before they made their own car. But um, but uh, the transmission, he he was advanced in that way. He adopted the planetary transmission, which mm. is back back in favor again today. Um, so so that his car would be that much sturdier. You know, they're very they're they're um, they don't fall apart. They're, they you can't really find them or grind them with that kind of transmission. <laughs> <laughs> was he using his, his molybdenum steel in that too? Is that part of the reason they were so uh, good? No, I don't think that was in that part, but I'm not sure. But but little by little, he took over every aspect so that he wasn't buying parts from, you know, as few outside parts as possible, maintaining the quality and upping the, obviously, the profit. When did the movement towards something other than a Model T? I know the Model A, and I mean, but having a line of different vehicles. When did that start to be part of the automotive scene? Yeah, for Ford, uh, you know, not in a big way till after World War II. To some extent, that started um, in the later '30s, but really, they, you know, even the Model A was a single. Then, you know, they came out with the Ford Eight. Uh, so there's. Um, there's you know ways to look at the 1930s, but basically they weren't. Of course, they had they did have Lincoln. Don't forget, uh, I should throw in they did have their their luxury line. How did companies like to take you to your other topic of great interest in the automotive area? How did Packard, relatively little company with a high end vehicle, how did it survive in that environment? Well, it. Um, it, it, a lot of people would say it didn't really survive too well after World War II. I mean, I would be one of them. They kind of, I always think of it that Packard kind of ceded its territory to Mercedes Benz. You know, all the same people that buy Mercedes now were buying Packard. So uh, they were putting out cars, but they weren't as extraordinary as they had been before World War II. As, as nice as they are, I don't want to insult anybody that has one, but a Packard was uh, was an amazing. Here's how great Packards were. James Cousins bought one after he left Ford Motor. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was an okay car. My, my father had a used one he loved, a 1949 Packard. Really. Yeah. So I, pride and joy. I, I just think it's marvelous that um, that if you had a Packard, it, it sort of meant something, you know, it meant that you had indeed arrived in America. What well, and Ford, of course, is known for philanthropy too, as well as Cousins and Ford Foundation and the rest. How did that come to be? Was that his heirs who mostly did the philanthropy or was it yeah. Henry Ford himself? Yeah, much more his heirs, but, um, but he did um, <clears throat> underwrite the uh, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. So, you know, he, he had his projects, but Ford Foundation was um, a little later than his. Did he turn payday. out in his later years to be a kind of curmudgeon? Um, <laughs> or was he always one? I don't know. Maybe I think that's he was one. just an introvert. You know, I think he just got to be a kind of kept to himself. Um, his other philanthropy is something I'm sure a lot of people watching, you know, have enjoyed, but he, he also... Uh, um, started buying antiques and things for the Henry Ford, for the v Dearborn Village. So he uh, he sponsored that. He was a guy that said, I wouldn't give a nickel for all the artwork in the world. <laughs> but he, <laughs> he did have a museum. <laughs> so, so if we were to go to the overall topic of the series and you took Henry Ford, put him in the balance, Bain or Benefactor, do you think oh. it's more Bain than Benefactor? Or I'm going to say, I'm going to say Benefactor to the whole country for um, really liberating a lot of people to lead whatever life they wanted in terms of uh, the freedom of the road. So I think he, he did more, much more good. As far as his political views, I, I'm not, I think some of them are still around that he kind of 
planted, so I'm bitter about that. But at the time, he was suppressed for the moment by, by much better people um, in you know, the Roosevelt tradition, Franklin Roosevelt kind of tradition. Uh, it's kind of pushed aside the worst aspects of Henry Ford. They did not, they didn't take hold. Did I understand you to say earlier, Julie, that his attitude towards women in the workforce changed too over time? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think he... <laughs> <laughs> he still, still didn't want him. He was... I don't think he was keen. No, but he. Um, but but the women started to be paid, uh, <clears throat> started to be paid more, and then finally, um, for a little while, got the five dollar day. Well, and we have another interesting question here: How much wealth did Ford amass in comparison with other leading industrialists? I assume we're talking American industrialists. Yeah. At that time. <laughs> Right, I think he was the richest man, America's only billionaire for a while, uh, for a long while before World War uh, II. So a billionaire back then was, oh. now they're a dime a dozen, at least in my town. <laughs> no, no, well, his... no, you couldn't even use the word billionaire back then, but he, you know, he was one early on. So he was front and center. Well, in his famous factory, I forget the name that was described to it, but it had, it was huge, right? By its time, it was sur un unsurpassed in terms yeah, of river, river Rouge, output. Right. Yeah, the Rouge, that's the one. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. Every, and he owned every, every doorknob. So yeah, he was, <laughs> he was far and away the America's richest man. That is very, very, very cool. Uh, part, yeah. What, I was going to well, say partly because John Rockefeller gave away so much of his money, you know, he probably would have given him a run for his money, but that's. <laughs> well, this has been an absolutely fascinating presentation, Julie. I thank you so much for the work you put into it and for telling us so much of this here. I mean, I've learned not only a lot about automotive, but a lot about what was happening in the world at the time that you've been talking about. Which oh, is well, fun. thank you. Thank you. And if anybody watching comes through Manlius, New York, they can have a ride in a Model A. <laughs> <laughs> free with every talk, with every, with every webinar, one free ride. <laughs> if you come to Wilton, Connecticut, I'm glad to give you a ride at either a Honda Odyssey or a Honda Pilot. <laughs> Statement well, of changing times, I suppose. <laughs> They're good too. Well, thank you, Steve. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. Well, well, it's likewise for me, Julie. And I know that Nick is likely going to want to come on at this point okay. and uh, give us some closing words going forward. I will tell you, the next presentation will take us into a, uh, a modern era. We've been talking history for the most part in these first three presentations, um, but we'll be moving forward in the next presentation into the modern era and talking about technology, particularly with a view to Zuckerberg and Facebook. Um, and our speaker for that, Dr. Harris, is quite an expert in this area, so it's going to be very, very interesting. And the last presentation will bring back Matt Warshaw, our professor at um, Central Connecticut State University, to wrap it all together and bring his own perspective to these fascinating presentations we've had and will continue to have in this series. So please stay tuned for the rest. Thank you all and thank you to our sponsors and to all of you. We look forward to seeing you the next time around. Yes, thank you, Steve. You can leave it to it. Um, <laughs> so um, our, our next lecture will actually be um, entitled Mark Zuckerberg, Poster Child for Promise and Peril in the Tech Sector. Um, and that will be uh, offered by Professor Drew Harris, as Steve mentioned, of Central Connecticut State University. That will be held on Sunday, April 3rd at 4 p.m., as all our lectures are, and it will be on Zoom, uh, similar with Zoom webinar. Um, so if you haven't registered for that, and I highly encourage you to do so, uh, you can visit either the Wilton Historical Society website or the Wilton Library website. We have registration links on both. Um, thank you to Steve and Julie for this wonderful discussion. Once again, um, another great addition to this fantastic series of lectures. 
Um, I thank everyone for joining us this afternoon and we're looking forward to the next lecture. So uh, take care, enjoy the rest of your weekend and uh, hopefully we'll see you on April 3rd. Take care, everyone.